Hello and welcome to Vanguard Audiobooks and the Learning College. I'm Alex Linder. You can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com and alexlinder.com, typically archived with a graphic representing the book that we're doing. We've done over a dozen so far, I believe. Now, today we're going to do session two of the Camp of the Saints. We did all the prefatory material in part one, session one, and pages 1 through 17, the first three chapters. Today we're going to do chapters 4 through 12, pages 18, up through 51. Let's get going. Now the scene as we left it, the old man is in France, in the hills kind of looking down on the Mediterranean coast, and into the bay where 800,000 Indians, Ganges Indians, lie in their nasty old steamers ready to invade in the morning. And that's where we ended last time. Now we pick up chapter 4, page 18. It was a curious night for New York, more calm and peaceful than the city had been in well over 30 years. Central Park stood deserted, drained of its thousands of canes on the prowl. Bible. Little girls could have gone there to play, pert toeheads, soft and pink in tiny skirts, delighted that, finally, they could romp through its grass. The black and Puerto Rican ghettos were quiet as churches. Dr. Norman Haller had opened his windows. He was listening to the city, but there wasn't a sound. It was that time of night when he would always hear the dreadful notes of what he called the, quote, infernal symphony. Unquote. rising up from the street below, the cries for help, the click-clack of running heels, the frantic screams, the gunshots, one by one or in bursts, the wail of police cars, the savage, less-than-human howls, the whimpering children, the vicious laughter, the shatter of glass, the horns of distress as some Cadillac, sleek and air-conditioned, would stop for a light and find itself buried in a sea of black silhouettes, brandishing picks, and then the, then the shouts of, no, 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 those desperate shouts shrieked into the darkness and suddenly stilled, snuffed out by a knife, a razor, a chain, by a club full of spikes, by a pounding fist or fingers or phallus. It had been that way for thirty years. Statistics in sound, in each year louder than the one before. That is, until those last few days when the graph had taken a sudden plunge, down to an unheard-of zero on the night in question. Thirty years for Dr. Norman Haller. Frustrating years, through no fault of his own. As consulting sociologist to the city of New York, he had seen it coming, predicted it to the letter. The proof was there in his lucid reports, ignored one and all. I guess that should be ignored by one and all, but the by is out of the text. There really was no solution. Black would be black and white would be white. There was no changing either, except by a total mix, a blend into tan. They were enemies on sight, and their hatred and scorn only grew as they came to know each other better. Now they both felt the same utter loathing. And so the consulting sociologist would give his opinion and pocket his money, the city had paid him a handsome price for his monumental study of social upheaval, with its forecast of ultimate doom. No hope, Dr. Haller? No hope, Mr. Mayor. Unless you kill them all, that is. Because you'll never change them. How about that? Good God, man, hardly. Let's just wait and see what happens and try to do the best we can. English way of muddling through. Plush as could be that suite of Dr. Norman Haller's on the 26th floor of Central Park's most elegant apartment building, protected from the jungle, cut off from the outside world with its dozen armed guards in the lobby, electronic sensors in every corner, invisible rays and alarms and attack dogs. And the garage, like a kind of hermetic chamber, drawbridge between life and death, between love and hate, ivory tower, moon base, bunker deluxe, at quite a price. 
Thousands and thousands of dollars for a few hundred pages written for the city of New York by the pen of America's most eminent consulting sociologist. Dr. Norman Haller had built himself a perfect world in the eye of the cyclone, and through that eye he could watch the storm that would sweep it all away. Whiskey, crushed ice, soft music. Go on, darling, put on that nice expensive little thing you call a dress. A telephone call. The mayor of New York. Don't tell me, Jack. Let me guess. You're sitting there all dressed up. You in your tux. Betty in a gown. Almost takes your breath away. She looks so good. Never better. On your third drink, I'd say. Fancy glasses. Just the two of you. Nice and cozy. No special reason. Spur of the moment, right? Exactly. But how on earth? Look. The old familiar jungle shuts up tight. The white man gets scared. What else can he do? One last fling for his white prestige. One final tribute to his useless millions. To his precious position above it all. So here's to you, Jack. Hear the tinkle? Hear the ice in my glass? My most expensive crystal. Scotch at a hundred bucks a throw. And my wife's eyes? Never been greener. So green I'm going to jump in and drown. Listen, Norman, it's all up to the French right now. Do you really think they can kill off a million poor defenseless bastards just like that? I don't. And frankly, I hope they can. I'll tell you something else. The ghettos here in the city don't think so either. Or in L.A. or Chicago. They may be caged like wildcats, but believe me, they're quiet as lambs. Calm as can be. They just sit at their radios and listen to the news. That is, when they're not in their churches, singing up a storm and praying like crazy for those goddamn ships. Ever been swept off your feet by a herd of stampeding lambs? Nah, I tell you, Norman, the third world's turned into a bunch of lambs, that's all. And the wolf is tired of being a wolf, is that what you're saying? Well, do like me, Jack. Have yourself another drink and run your fingers up and down your wife's white skin, nice and slow, like something very precious. And wait. Dot, dot, dot. Chapter 5. If any logic at all can be found in the way a popular myth gets its start, then we have to go back to Calcutta, to the Consulate General of Belgium, to look for the beginnings of the one we can call, for the moment, quote, the myth of the newfound paradise, unquote. A shabby little consulate set up in an old colonial villa on the edge of the diplomatic quarter waking one morning to find a silent throng milling about outside its doors. At daybreak, the Sikh guard had chained the front gate shut. From time to time, he would point the barrel of his antique rifle between the bars to urge back the ones who had pushed their way up front, but since he was a decent sword, and since there was really no threat to himself or the gate he was guarding, he would tell them now and again as nicely as he could, Look, Maybe in a little while you can have some rice, but then you'll have to go. It's no use standing around. See the announcement? It's signed by the consul himself. What does it say? The crowd would yell, since none of them could read. Tell us! Read it out loud! As a matter of fact, it was hard to make out much of anything now on the notice posted on the gate, smudged as it was with a prince of the thousands of hands that had pawed it over, never quite believing the bad news it proclaimed. But the guard knew the text by heart. He had had to recite it now for a week, day in and day out, and he droned it through, word for word, from beginning to end. Colon. Pursuant to the royal decree of such and such date, the government of Belgium has decided to terminate until further notice all adoption procedures presently underway. Henceforth, no new request for adoption will be accepted. Similarly, no Belgian entry visas will be granted for those children currently being processed for departure, even in those cases where legal adoption antedates the present decree. A long moan ran through the crowd. Judging by its length and volume, and by the fact that it welled up out of the silence each time it seemed about to die, the Sikh guard, a master at gauging mass distress, guessed that their number had doubled, at least, since the day before. Come on now, move back, he shouted, shaking his gun. Let's all quiet down. You'll get your rice, and then you'll have to go back where you came from. And you better stay there from now on, too. You heard the announcement. Up front, a woman stepped out of the crowd and started to speak. All the rest stopped to listen, as if she were speaking for each and every one. She was holding a child in her outstretched arms, a little boy, maybe two years old, 
thrusting his face so close to the gate that it made him cross his big, gaping eyes. "'Look at my son,' she cried. "'Isn't he pretty? "'Isn't he solid and strong for his age, "'with his plump little thighs and his arms and his nice straight legs? "'See, look at his mouth. "'See how white and even his teeth are, "'and his face, not a scab, not a fly. "'And his eyes, never any pus. "'White open all the time. "'And his hair. "'You could grab it and pull it, and he wouldn't lose a one. "'Look between his legs. "'See how clean it all is? "'Even his little bottom.' and his belly, nice and flat, not swollen like some babies his age. I could show you what comes out when he goes, and you wouldn't see a worm, not even a speck of blood. No, he's a good, healthy child, like the paper said he had to be, because we fed him the best. We fattened him up just for that, from the day he was born. We saw how pretty he was, and we made up our minds we would send him, so we could grow up there, and be rich and happy. And we fed him more and more, just like the clinic told us. Then his sisters died, the two of them. They were older than he was, but such sickly little things, and he was so hungry and prettier every day. He could eat enough for three, God bless him. And now you're trying to tell me that we fattened him up for nothing? That his poor father slaved in the rice fields and worked himself to death all for nothing? And that I'm going to have him on my hands for good and keep him and feed him? No, it's my turn to eat. And I'm hungry, you hear? Yes, it's my turn now, because he's big and strong. Besides, he's not mine now. He's not even mine. He's got a new family halfway around the world, and they're waiting to take him and give him their name. See? It says so on the medal they sent us. The one around his neck. See, I'm not lying. He's theirs now. Take him. He's theirs. I'm through. They promised. I did what they told me, and now, no. Now I'm too tired. A hundred women pushed forward, each one with a child in her outstretched arms. And they cried out things like, He's theirs now, he's theirs. Or, They promised to take him. Pretty babies, mostly, all looking as if they had fed themselves plump on the flesh of their mothers. Poor, haggard souls, these mothers, drained dry as if the umbilical cords were still intact. And the crowd howled, Take them, take them, they're theirs now, take them while hundreds of others pressed forward behind the ones up front with armfuls of babes by the hundreds, and hundreds of bigger ones, too, all ripe for adoption, pushing them up to the brink to take the giant leap to paradise. The Belgian decree, far from stemming the human flood, had increased it tenfold. When man has nothing left, he looks askance at certainty. Experience has taught him that it's not meant for him. As likelihood fades, myth looms up in its place. The dimmer the chance, the brighter the hope. And so there they were, thousands of wretched creatures, hoping, crowding against the consulate gates, like the piles of a fruit crafty like the piles of fruit a crafty merchant heaps on his stand, afraid it might spoil, the best ones up front, all shiny and tempting, the next best right behind, still in plain sight. And not too bad if you don't look too close. Then the ones barely visible, the damaged ones, starting to rot, all wormy inside, or turn so you can't see the mold. Milling about, way back in the crowd, the women with the monsters, the horrors that no one would take off their hands. And they moaned and groaned louder than all the rest, since their hope knew no bounds. Turned back, pushed aside, driven off day after day, they had come to believe that a paradise so well protected was worth besieging for the rest of their lives if need be. Before, when the gate was open and the beautiful children had gone streaming through, occasionally one of these mothers would manage to slip her monster in line, which was something at least, a step toward salvation, even though the Sikh would always hold up his rifle and bar the council's door. They had come close, and that was enough to nurture their hope, enough to make it spring to life with extravagant visions of milk and honey, flowing untapped into rivers thick with fish and waters, waters washed fields fairly bursting with crops, far as the eye could see, growing wild for the taking, where little monster children could roll about to their heart's content. The simpler the folk, the stronger the myth. Soon everyone heard their babble, believed their fantasies, and dreamed the same wild dreams of life in the West. The problem is that, in famine rack Calcutta, everyone means quite a few. Could that be one explanation? 
And that's a line that will become a motif, a theme in this book. Could this be one explanation? He's not, as he says, he's a writer, he's a novelist. He's not a theorist or an ideologue or even a political partisan. He's a novelist. He's telling you a story. And part of that story, as this concerns matters political, is, is suggesting. He's suggesting it's up to you to think about it. Well, is this a reason? Well, you say, yes, it is a reason. Well, how much of this is attributable to this particular reason versus this other 10 that he's going to cite as we move through? Could that be the one explanation? Desperate peoples, the small chance but the great hope. Way back, behind the backmost women in the crowd, a giant of a man stood stripped to the waist, holding something over his head and waving it like a flag. Untouchable pariah, this dealer in droppings, dung roller by trade, molder of manure briquettes, turd eater in time of famine, and holding high in his stinking hands a mass of human flesh. At the bottom, two stumps. Then an enormous trunk, all hunched and twisted and bent out of shape. No neck, but a kind of extra stump. A third one in place of a head, and a bald little skull with two holes for eyes and a hole for a mouth. But a mouth that was no mouth at all, no throat, no teeth, just a flap of skin over his gullet. The monster's eyes were alive, and they stared straight ahead, high over the crowd, frozen forward in a relentless gaze. Except, that is, when his pariah father would wave him bodily back and forth. It was just that lidless gaze that flashed through the bars of the gate and caught the eye of the consul himself, staring in spellbound horror. He had stepped outside for a look at the crowd to see what was going on, but it wasn't the crowd he saw, and all at once he closed his eyes and began to shout, No rice! No visas! No anything! You won't get another thing, do you hear? Now get out! Get out! Every one of you! Out! As he turned to rush off, a sharp little stone hit him square on the forehead and left a gash. The monster's eyes lit up. The quiver that ran through his frame was his way of thanking his father. And that was all. No other act of violence. Yet suddenly the keeper of the milk and honey, stumbling back to his consulate, head in hands, struck the crowd as a rather weak defender of the sacred portals of the Western world. So weak, in fact, that if only they could wait, sooner or later he was bound to drop the keys. Could that be one explanation? Dot, dot, dot. The Sikh took aim. The hint was enough. They all squatted down in their haunches, hushed and still, like waters ebbing before the flood. Chapter 6 You and your pity, the consul shouted, your damned, obnoxious, detestable pity. Call it what you please. World brotherhood, charity, conscience. I take one look at you, each and every one of you, and all I see is contempt for yourselves and all you stand for. Do you know what it means? Can't you see where it's leading? You've got to be crazy. Crazy or desperate. You've got to be out of your minds just to sit back and let it all happen little by little, all because of your pity, your insipid, insufferable pity. The consul was sitting behind his desk, a bandage on his forehead. Across from him some ten or so figures sat rooted to wooden chairs like apostles carved in stone on a church facade. Each of the statues had the same white skin, the same gaunt face, the same simple dress, long duck pants or shorts, half sleeve khaki shirt, open sandals, Van Driesen types, and most of all the same deep unsettling gaze that shines in the eyes of prophets, philanthropists, seers, fanatics, criminal geniuses, martyrs, weird and wondrous folk of every stripe, those split personality creatures who feel out of place in the flesh they were born with. One was a bishop, but unless you already knew it, it was quite impossible to tell him apart from the missionary doctor or the starry-eyed layman by his side. Just as impossible to single out the atheist philosopher and the renegade Catholic writer, convert to Buddhism, both spiritual leaders of the little band. They all just sat there without a word. The trouble is, the consul continued, you've gone too far, and on purpose, because you're so convinced that it's the right thing to do. Have you any idea how many children from the Ganges here have been shipped off to Belgium, not to mention the rest of Europe and those other sane countries that closed their borders off before we did? Forty thousand. 
That's how many. 40,000 in five years. And all of you, so sure you could count on our people, playing on their sentiments, their sympathy, perverting their minds with vague feelings of self-reproach, to twist their Christian charity to your own bizarre ends, weighing our good, solid burgers down with a sense of shame and guilt. 40,000, why, there weren't even that many French in Canada back in the 1700s. And in two-faced times like these, you can bet the government would admit what's really behind that racist decree. Yes, racist, that's what I called it. You loathe the word, don't you? You've gone and worked up a race problem out of a whole cloth, right in the heart of the white world, just to destroy it. That's what you're after. You want to destroy our world, our whole way of life. There's not one of you proud of his skin and all that it stands for. Not proud or aware of it either, one of the statues corrected. That's the price we have to pay for the brotherhood of man. We're happy to pay it. Yes, well, we've gone well beyond that now, said the consul. Adoption isn't the issue any more, discontinued or otherwise. I've been on the phone with my colleagues in all the Western consulates. They tell me it's just the same. Great crowds outside, milling around, quiet, as if they're waiting for something to happen. And mind you, none of the others have decrees on their gates. Besides, look at the English. Their visas were like hen's teeth. But that hasn't kept 10,000 people from squatting in the gardens outside their consulate. It's the same all over the city. Wherever a western flag is flying, there's a crowd out there waiting. Just waiting. And that's not all. I've heard that back in the hinterlands, whole villages are swarming out onto the roads to Calcutta. Very true, said another of the statues, his face trimmed with long blonde whiskers. They're the villages we've been working with, mainly. Well, if you know them, what on earth do they want? What are they waiting for? Frankly, we're not quite sure. Do you have an idea? Perhaps. The bearded statue's lips broke out in a curious smile. Was it the bishop, the renegade writer? He's saying that all these people, no matter if they're religious or not, they're all brotherhood of man nuts, and they want to destroy their own kind. It doesn't really matter which of it is. It could be a bishop, but it could just well be some atheist uh, writer, he's saying. You mean you had the nerve? The consul began leaving his question and thought in the air. No, I don't believe it. You wouldn't go that far. Quite so, said a third statue, the bishop this time in the flesh. I wouldn't have gone that far myself. Are you saying that you've lost control? I'm afraid we have. But it doesn't matter. Most of us are glad to go along. You're right. There is something brewing. And it's going to be tremendous. The crowds can feel it, even if they have no notion what it's all about. Myself, I have one explanation. Instead of the piecemeal adoptions that these poor folk have hoped for and lived for, perhaps now they're hoping and living for something much bigger, something wild and impossible, like a kind of adoption and mass. And mass. In a country like this, that's all it would take to push a movement beyond the point of no return. Nice work, your grace, the consul reported, retorted simply. A lovely job for a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church. Mercenary, hireling to the pagans, all of a sudden. What is this, the Crusades in reverse? Judas leaping up on Peter the hermit's nag and crying down with Jerusalem? Well, you chose a good time. There's no shortage of poor. There are millions and millions. The year isn't three months old, and already half this province alone is starving. And the government won't do a thing. They've had it. Whatever happens now, they're going to wash their hands. That's what every consul in the city heard this morning. And what have you been doing in the meantime? You've been bearing witness. Isn't that what you call it? Bearing witness to what? To your faith? Your religion? To your Christian civilization? Oh no, none of that. Bearing witness against yourselves. Like the anti-Western cynics you've all become. Do you think the poor devils that flock to your side aren't any the wiser? Nonsense. They see right through you. For them, white skin means weak convictions. They know how weak yours are. And they know you've given in. You can thank yourselves for that. The one thing your struggle for their souls has left them is the knowledge that the West, your West, is rich. To them, you're the symbols of abundance. By your presence alone, they see that it does exist somewhere, and they see that your conscience hurts you for keeping it all to yourselves. You can dress up in rags and pretend to be poor, eat handfuls of curry to your heart's content, you can spread your acolytes far and wide, let them live like the peasants and dispense their wise advice. It's no use. They'll always envy you, no matter how you try. You know I'm right. After all your help, 
all the seeds and drugs and technology. They found it so much simpler just to say, here's my son, here's my daughter, take them, take me, take us all to your country. And the idea caught on. You thought it was fine. You encouraged it, organized it. But now it's too big. Now it's out of your hands. It's a flood, a deluge, and it's out of control. Well, thank God we still have an ocean between us. Yes, an ocean. We do have an ocean, a forest statue observed, lost in reflection at the obvious thought. You know, the consul went on, there's a very old word that describes the kind of men you are. It's traitor. That's all. You're nothing new. There have been all kinds. We've had bishop traitors, knight traitors, general traitors, statesman traitors, scholar traitors, and just plain traitors. It's a species the West abounds in, and it seems to get richer and richer the smaller it grows. Funny you would think it should be the other way around. But the mind decays, the spirit warps, and the traitors keep coming. Since that day in 1522, the 12th of October, when that noble knight, Andrea de Amaral, your patron saint, threw open the gate, gates of Rhodes to the Turks, well, that's how it is, and no one can change it. I can't, I'm sure. But I can tell you this. I may be wrong about your results, but I find your actions beneath contempt. Gentlemen, your passports will not be renewed. That's the one official way I can still show you how I feel. And my Western colleagues are doing the same with any of their nationals involved. One of the statues stood up, the one who had mused about the ocean. He was, in fact, the atheist philosopher known in the West by the name of Balan, B-A-L-L-A-N. Quote, Passports, countries, religions, ideals, races, borders, oceans, Balan shouted. What bloody rubbish! And he left the room without another word. At any rate, the consul said, I suppose I should thank you for hearing me out. I imagine I've seen the last of you all. That's probably why you've been so patient. I'm nothing now, as far as you're concerned, just a relic, a dying breed. Not quite, replied the bishop. We'll both be relics together, only on different sides, that's all. You see, I'll never leave India. Outside the consulate gates, Balin elbowed his way through the crowd, through the crush of monster children. The most monstrous of the lot clinged to the legs, drooling on his trousers. Balin held a strange fascination for the monsters, the same fascination they held for him. He reached into his pockets, always filled with sticky sweets, and stuffed their shapeless mouths. Then he noticed the giant, the turd-eater, standing there still topped with his hideous totem, and Balin called out, "'What are you doing here, dung man? What do you want?' "'Please take us with you. Please!' Today's the day, my friend. We'll both be in paradise, you and I. Today? The poor man repeated, bewildered, and Balin smiled a compassionate smile. Could that be one explanation? Sorry to use that three times by page 28. Chapter 7. Quote, dot, dot, dot. In the four departments bordering the coast, back to France again, under the command of the Undersecretary Monsieur Jean Paré, personal representative of the President of the Republic, P E R R E T, the Army will make every effort to protect all property left behind insofar as its other duties permit. Government sources confirm that the President of the Republic will address the nation at midnight tonight with a message of grave concern. And that's repetition of what we heard earlier before we went over to from France to India. The ones who knew French turned down their radios and translated the announcement for the horde of compatriots piled on all sides. The cellar had never seemed so nearly full as it did that night. It housed the black rubbishmen of the northern wards of Paris, Paris, with all of them crammed together in, crammed in together, ate to a double-deck bed, legs dangling over the edges. There was a feeling of solidity and strength that even themselves had never noticed, that they that even they themselves had never noticed. Oddly enough for such talkative types, no one dared risk a word, not even the handful of whites that were part of the vast mass of black, among them one of those ragtag priests and a militant tough at war with the social order. Everyone was thinking, straining his mind to the utmost. It's not easy to conceive the dizzying dimensions of something so unbelievable when you live in a strange city, down some godforsaken cellar, and the only time you get out is 
first thing every dismal morning to pick up the rubbish along nameless streets. And if they managed to land in one piece, what then? asked one of them, the one they called the chief, since he had lived in France for quite some time. What if they land? Will all of you climb up out of your rat holes, too? The only reply was a long, meaningless murmur. None of those underfed brains worked fast enough to picture the possible chain of events. But something was building up inside, something slow to take shape, but powerful and solemn all the same. Then, from the dark recesses of one of the bunks, a voice boomed out. All depends. Will there be enough rats? By daylight, the ragtime priest replied, they'll be thick as the trees in a giant forest, sprung up overnight in the darkness. That much they understood, and the murmur rippled with approval. Then they sat back, ready to wait. There were others waiting, too, that night. The swill men, sewer men, sweepers from all the dumps the length and breadth of Paris, the peons and bedpan pushers from all the hospitals, the dishwashers from the shabby cafes, the laborers from Billancourt and Javel, from St. Saint-Denis and beyond, the swivel-hip menials digging their pits around gas pipes and cables, the fodder for industry's lethal chores, the machinery feeders, the metro troglodytes, black crabs with ticket-punching claws, the stinking drudges who mucked around in filth, and the myriad more embodiments all of the hundreds of essential jobs that the French had let slip through their delicate fingers, plus the ones who were coughing their lungs out in the clinics, and the ones with a healthy dose in the civilist wards, syphilis wards, all in all a few hundred thousand Arabs and blacks, invisible somehow to the ostrich Parisians, and far more numerous than anyone would think, since the powers that be had doctored the statistics, afraid of jolting the sleepwalking city too violently out of its untroubled trance, I lying about the number of aliens in France. Paris was no New York. They waited now, the same meek way they lived, overlooked and unknown, in virtual terror, whole tribes of fellow sufferers, hiding away in the depths of their cellars or huddling together up under the eaves, happy to shut themselves off in infested streets where grimy facades hid unsuspected ghettos, as wholly unknown to the people of Paris as Ravensbrück and Dachau, once upon a time, had been to the Germans. It was only among the Arabs that the thought of the unlikely confrontation brewing off the southern coast of France would occasionally take a vengeful turn. Nothing too concrete yet, and again, how dated is this now, when they openly have been burning cars for over a decade in these places. They've come out from under the eaves and up from the gutters, out of the basements, and been loose into the, into the public streets where they pray and block the street. But back then, in 72, he was saying, nothing too concrete yet, only shadowy yearnings and suppressed desires, like the wish to see a Frenchwoman smile rather than dr dreaming of having to rape her, or being able to get yourself a pretty whore instead of hearing her tell you, I don't go to bed with dirty Arabs, or just being able to take a carefree walk through the park and not suddenly see all the terrified females cluster around to protect their young like mother hens ready to pounce. That evening, only the most fanatic envisioned a new kind of holy war, and one that wasn't even theirs to wage. Still, in no time at all, the Algerian quarters all through Paris and the suburbs had been zoned off again into sectors. A certain Mohammed, the one called Caddy One-Eye, C-A-D-I, One-Eye hyphenated, appeared to be in supreme command. A certain Mohammed, the one called Caddy One-Eye, appeared to be in supreme command. By eleven that night, he had managed to pass his first orders down the line to all the sector chiefs. The time for violence is over. Have them put away their razors. Have them break their knives in two. The first one I hear of who spills any blood, I'll see that he is castrated. He was an Arab, and he knew how to talk to Arabs, and so they all obeyed him. Except, that is, for his schoolteacher wife, who was white and French. Indeed, his own razor was quick to disappear. It was hidden inside her right stocking, flat against the thigh. Elise had known what contempt was like. For all ten years of her married life, not one of its subtle barbs had escaped her. She cherished a dream of redemption by blood, and she wasn't alone. Of all the French wives of ghetto Arabs, a scant thousand perhaps, 
not a few had felt that burden of contempt. Among the Arabs, unlike the blacks, they were the only the only Western intruders. The clan, so the only whites are the, these mud sharks who are mixed in, about a thousand of them, you see. Among the Arabs, unlike the blacks, they were the only Western intruders. The clan loathed the stranger all the more as friend than foe, and if it accepted these Christian wives at all, it was only because it had swallowed them up, only because they belonged to it utterly, sex and soul, even more than French women do to their Frenchmen. There were some, though, who had a clear notion of just what a crucial struggle the next day would bring. They had closed their shutters, barred their doors, drawn the drapes in their rooms and offices, and sat clustered in silence around their radios, eager for news, waiting like everyone else for the promised address by the President of the Republic. They were the third world diplomats and students, Africans, Arabs, Asians, on the verge of panic with nowhere to turn. They had even stopped calling back and forth between their embassies, between their homes, so suddenly crushed by the turn of events that they, the rich, the select, the leaders, the militant elite, no longer even bothered to keep abreast of each other. To keep abreast of each other. Which was all the stranger since, during the fifty days of the fleet's dramatic odyssey over two oceans, they had been consumed in a frenzy of thoughtful reflection, issuing endless communiques, holding press conferences, interviews, meetings, debates, one after another, while the fleet pressed on and on, a mixture of fact and myth, a phenomenon so untoward that people would have to see it before they believed it. Then Gibraltar, finally, and see, and see it they did, and suddenly all those eager devotees stopped wagging their tongues, their zeal turned to panic, and some, if the dark truth be known, had to hold back a flood of hate at the brink. So what he's given you is some of the subtle play that would happen if, if these third world radicals like DeRay McKisson, funded by Jews, actually got what they're trying to get. They would find themselves as useless tools swept aside by the, because they are a, a flower that only blooms in white lands, this protected class of, of alien leaders. And when the real drudges show up, in teeming millions from the third world, they aren't going to have anything to do with black leaders in a white country, or Arab leaders. They're going to wash them away just as surely as the whites. And they're dimly becoming aware of this, and that's why their tongues are halted. Closed now, the West Indian bars, the Chinese restaurants, the African dance halls, the Arab cafes, in the light of other reports, from embassy guards, from worker and student informers, these signs all tended to kill any lingering doubts the police might have had that the situation in Paris, 800 kilometers from the refugee fleet, was as grave as it was along the southern coast. Yes, a state of emergency should be declared here too, and the whole array of preventive measures, while they still had time. The prefect of the police called the LSA Palace. He tried to get through to the Minister of the Interior, but all he was told was that the meeting was still in progress. Three quarters of an hour to go before the address, and the government still had made up its mind. Exclamation point. The prefect, too, assumed that all he could do now was wait. Could that be one explanation? Moving on to chapter 8. Balan's smile had worked a miracle. Often a man needs nothing more to help him discover himself, praise the Lord. And Balin indeed proceeded to praise him, though with jibe and jest, which was his particular way of being an atheist. I tell you, God, he said to himself, if you've had to listen to that dung man's harangue the way I have for the last three days, you must be kicking yourself for letting one smile from me turn him into such a talker. Just listen to that shit roller carry on, will you? A thousand years of poverty and degradation, all for what? to produce the most prodigious demagogue this country has ever seen rise up from the masses. I don't know if you're pleased with your miracle, God. All I can say is it was bound to happen. Can a man spend his whole life grubbing for turds and all the slop pots along the Ganges, shaping them, rolling them about between his fingers, day after day, and not know something about the true nature of man? He knew all there was to know. He just never knew that he knew. That's all. Now he knows. And you and I know where he's leading us, don't we? Seriously, God, is all this your idea? 
Well, even if it is, I'm going to wait and see how it all ends before you convince me. But I will say this much. It would certainly be your first clear-headed, clear-cut proof that you really exist. Down under the pier, the river was teeming with corpses. Floating among the wooden pilings and their saris flowing free spread the black waters with a carpet of light. A few were still struggling, but most of them had already drowned, quite dead, some since that morning, some since the night before or the morning before, dropping like so much excess fruit from some prolific tree. All at once a young girl fell, a dark-skinned goddess. She fell without a murmur, feet first, her bare arms ringed with gold, straight by her sides, and the Ganges' gelatinous waters opened without a sound to let her through. A moment later an old man fell, naked, all bones, and he sank to the bottom. Then a baby, wriggling and squirming like an animal that knows it's about to die. Then a pair of children, clasped in tight embrace. Up above, no one bent down or held out a hand. Why bother? The ones who were pushed to the edge knew only too well that their turn would come, that they too would fall. Pressed on by the huge throng swarming through the port, on every dock and their plunge into the watery deep held no meaning of death, but rather of life as they felt themselves drawn on at the last by a resistless force that nothing could possibly stop. On the pier, the turd-eater, perched on the low, flat cart, was speaking his piece, with the monster totem still on his shoulders, stiff as a pike. But believe it or not, the monster's eyes had begun to shine, and his gaze grew so intense as this latter-day Christopher spoke that no one in the crowd looked at anything else. They all stood there drinking it in, and every soul in the light of that gaze was filled with sacred fire at the awesome account. Buddha and Allah, they groaned, and Siva, Vishnu, Garuda, Ganesha, Krishna, Parvati, Indra, Durga, Surya, Bhairava, Ravana, Kali. The whole Hindu pantheon passed in review, and each drone name drew wails of ecstasy. All met together once upon a time and went to visit the nice little god of the Christians. They pulled out the nails, took him down from his cross. They mopped his brow, soothed him with their holy balms. And when he was healed, they sat him in their midst, gave a little nod and said, You owe us your life. Now what are you going to give us in return? Even the Pope isn't that ecumenical, Balin observed as he listened and thralled the white atheist listening to the monsters. Uh, carrier speaking. This shit picker beats the Christians at their own game. Ecumenism, all right, but planet wide. That's the the uh, reconciling of different faiths. And so, the turd eater continued, the nice little god off his cross rubbed the feeling back into his arms and legs, shook them, twisted his neck a few times in every direction, and said, That's true. I owe you my life, and I'm not going to give you and I'm going to give you my kingdom in return. Now the thousand years are ended. The nations are rising from the four corners of the earth, and their number is like the sand of the sea. They will march up over the broad earth and surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city. The camp of the saints is the Western uh, civilization, which is identified with Christianity, I suppose. There was a pause. The monster's eyes grew dim. The turd eater suddenly seemed disturbed. He began to jerk and twitch. Incredible, Balin thought. Who would believe it? Apocalypse, chapter 20, 7 through 9. A few changes here and there, but plain enough. Now he's all shaken up, poor bastard. The rest just won't come. Or maybe he's trying to fight it back. Yes, that's it. Good for him. The monster's eyes lit up like a beacon, a sign that the pause was over. That's what the nice little god of the Christians told them. Phew, Balin exclaimed. That was close. Do you know how the rest of it goes, God? Do you? Well, let me remind you. Quoting, and, and fire from God came down out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the pool of fire and brimstone, where are also the beast and the false prophet. Of course you know how it goes. You knew it all the time, but you kept it to yourself. Right, God? Disgusting. You just don't have the old faith anymore. 
There on the docks by the Ganges, in a silence that defied belief when you consider that 500,000 souls were already massed by the water's edge, and that every road to the port was submerged beneath a human flood, the turd-eater took up his inspired narration. Yes, that is what he told them. Then Allah and Buddha and Siva, Kali, Vishnu, Krishna pulled him into a circle around the empty cross, and everyone went to work. With the pieces of the cross they built themselves a boat, a big one, one that could sail the seas and cross the great oceans, a boat as big as the India Star. Then they gathered together their necklaces and diadems, their bracelets and rings, and they said to the captain, It is only right that we should pay you. Here, take all this. You've traveled the world up and down. Come, show us the way to paradise. And so the boat put out to sea with thousands more behind it. But the nice little god of the Christians was left alone on shore, running back and forth on his clumsy white legs, crying, And me? And me? Why have you forsaken me? And Buddha and Allah called back to him through their megaphones, and the wind brought him their reply. You gave us your kingdom. Now the time is past when you can give with one hand and take back with the other. But if you are really the son of God, then come, walk on the water and join us. The nice little god walked on the water, brave as could be. When the waves came up to his mouth and his eyes, he drowned. And no one heard tell of him much any more, except in a holy book that no one paid it any attention to after that. And so the trip went on. It was long and filled with danger. Everyone on board was hungry. Even Allah and Buddha and Siva, Kali, Vishnu, and all the folks who had joined them. Many, many died along the way, and others were born to take their place. But in time the sun stopped burning hot, the air grew mild and gentle, and the western paradise appeared, spread out before them with its streams of milk and honey, its rivers thick with fish, its fields fairly bursting with crops, far as the eye could see, growing wild for the taking, and not a soul was there, not a living soul, which really wasn't surprising after all, since the nice little god of the Christians was dead. And so the monster children began to dance on the deck of the India Star. The people sang and sang all through the night. We were finally there. A shout burst out that sounded like a cry of victory. Balin looked up. On the totem's utterly motionless face, he glimpsed that flap of flesh that passed for a mouth as it opened and shut. At that providential sign, the crowd began to stir. Could that be one explanation? And that was how the first of the ships, the India Star, came to be boarded. So this monster has a vision and re relays it to the 500,000 crowd, and they start to build a ship and board a ship. Chapter 9. The India Star, moored at her berth for over a year, was a 60-year-old steamer, veteran of the India Mail, run back under the British, under the Raj, Old as she was, she had stood up fairly well to the early rigors of independence. But all too soon she had found herself consigned to hauling human wrecks, displaced by the partition, and later, worst of all, wretched pilgrims on their way to Mecca. Of her five stacks straight up like pipes, four were lopped off at different levels by time, by rust, by lack of care, by chance. In such a state she hardly seemed fit for anything but one final act of heroic desperation. So this is a ship that needs to be junked, but it's what they got. Perhaps that was what the captain had in mind when he ordered his tattered crew to put the rotting gangplanks down again, the same ones he had had them pull up just three days before when the crowd seemed about to swell to precarious size. Actually, the captain's action would be quite hard to fathom were it not for the strong likelihood that someone had put the idea in his head. As a matter of fact, Ballin had managed to steal on board the night before with no particular end in mind, but just for a first-hand look at the strangely fortuitous conditions and the chain of inexorable events that seemed to be forming. And he wasn't alone. Several others had had the same idea. To wit, a group of nameless Indians, whites, and a Chinaman. Experts, one and all, in mob psychology. They were the movers, the undercover force. Acting on pure intuition, they knew precisely what to do. One of them stationed himself on the bridge, persuasive grenade in hand, while the others proceeded to question the captain. Just how much would it take, coal, water, supplies, the barest essentials, to make the trip to Europe? 
and back, the captain had asked. That is, if she'll make it. We won't be coming back, the one with the grenade had replied. It was then that Ballin had arrived on the scene, and although he was a stranger to their persons and their plans, they all understood one another at once, like a chosen few admitted to the mysteries. But what mysteries were they, and how had they been chosen? Spontaneous though they may seem, mass movements seldom occur without a degree of a certain degree of manipulation. That being the case, one is quick to picture a kind of almighty conductor, a great manipulator-in-chief pulling thousands of strings the world over, and aided here and there by gifted soloists. Nothing could be further from the truth. What happens is that, in this world of warped senses, certain creatures of outstanding mind, for good or ill, begin to stir, to look for a way to fight off uncertainty, a way to escape from a human condition whose age-old persistence they refuse to accept. Unsure of what lies beyond, they plunge headlong all the same in a wild flight into the future, burning their bridges of sober reflection behind them. Each one pulls the strings to the lobes of his brain, but here precisely is today's great mystery. All of those strings, independent of each other, are nonetheless bound up together and stem from one selfsame current of thought. The world is controlled, so it seems, not by a single specific conductor, but by a new apocalyptic beast, a kind of anonymous, omnipresent monster, and one that, in some primordial time, must have vowed to destroy the Western world. Kind of reminds me, if you've ever seen those giant, those crab fishing shows, those giant masses of those, I don't know if they're king crabs or what, but under the sea where there's a, a square mile of them, and they all kind of vaguely move. This is the figure that jumps into my mind, anyway, when he's just trying to describe how the mass mind works. a kind of anonymous, omnipresent monster, and one that, in some primordial time, must have vowed to destroy the Western world. The beast has no set plan. It seizes whatever occasions arise. The crowd massed along the Ganges was merely the latest, and doubtless the one with the richest potential. Divine in origin, this beast, or infernal, more likely? Questions. Divine in origin, or infernal, more likely? from heaven or hell. Be that as it may, the phenomenon, hard to believe, is a good two centuries old. Dostoevsky analyzed it once upon a time, and Pegwy, P-E, or Pegwy, P-E-G-Y, too, though in different form, when he railed against, quote, the intellectual clique. And even one of our former popes, Paul the Sixth, toward the end of his reign, as he opened his eyes and discerned at long last the work of the devil, nothing can stop the beast. That much we all know, which is probably why the chosen few have such faith that their ideas will triumph, and why the ones who persist in the struggle know only too well how futile it is. Fallen archangel that he was, Balin knew the lackeys of the beast on sight, and put himself at their disposal. That too is an explanation, and here it's not a question but a statement. And he offered the dung man and his hideous son to their cause. In three days their power over the hordes had reached such heights that the vertical pair together had become the crusade's unchallenged leader. Balin was quite content just to follow along and listen, whispering a practical thought in the turd eater's ear from time to time between two volleys and hearing him work them into epic account with incredible speed and skill. They'll take over the India Star first thing tomorrow, the Chinaman had said. They're ready, but they don't see it yet. All we need is to find the right idea to open their eyes. We'll have to pay for the coal and provisions, the Indians had added, but our women still have a few jewels, even the poorest, and even our lowliest brothers have a rupee or two put aside for the gods. A pittance, to be sure, but multiply a pittance by a thousand times, a thousand, and you have enough coal, rice, and water to take you to Europe. They're ready, but we have to find the right idea. Leave the idea to me, Balin had answered. Later, he couldn't remember if he really had put the idea in his head, or if the turd eater had read his mind. An illiterate Hindu pariah who can quote from Apocalypse, transform the Gospels, fabricate, fabricate legend to an inspiring event, could probably read the mind of the likes of Balin, too. He had said, quote, dot, 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 
Then they gathered together their necklaces and diadems, their bracelets and rings, and they said to the captain, It's only right that we should pay you. Here, take all this. You've traveled the world up and down. Come, show us the way to paradise. Dot, dot, dot. And the first collection had begun, even before his tale was over. Gourd bowls in hand, the totem's monster minions wormed their way through the crowd. These wretches, more used to taunts and blows than to alms and compassion, these beggars with their ever-empty bowls, hands open onto the void, now found themselves pouring out piles of treasure at the prophet's feet, then trotting back on their twisted legs for more as the crowd kept calling, Over here! Over here! In no time at all, once it was started, the money changers had the affair in hand. They set up impromptu networks, organized an army of collectors. Most incredible of all, the crowd didn't even distrust them. At the sight of the gold and rupees heaped up like the sand in a giant hourglass, everyone saw himself playing a part in the legend. And when the turd eater pictured the fleet of the gods at the gates of the west, and described the people singing on the deck of the India Star, they all turned and looked at the India Star, and reached out their arms to paradise. Chapter 10, page 40 The turd eater went on board before all the rest. As the monster totem's rigid head traced its wake through the crowd, like a periscope poking up out of the water, they all fell still. The silence spread out from the dock in a wave, rolling on past the harbor as far as the innermost streets of the quarter, where the hordes kept coming to join the swelling numbers. First the monster's head stood out against the side of the ship, then his father's, and everyone could gaze at the symbolic pair slowly climbing up the gangplank. For the ones on the edge of the swarm, and those even farther away who couldn't see a thing but who heard the description pass to the outer reaches from mouth to mouth, the prophet's ascent became a god's ascension. Now no one could doubt that the enterprise must be divine. No one, that is, but the little commando bands, instigators all, who at that very moment were visiting the other ships in port, as well as every other port along the Ganges. Atheist though he was, Balin himself began to have some second thoughts as he heard the sudden clamor rise up out of the crowd. Up on the bridge of the India Star, the turd eater lifted his hands toward the sky. He grasped his son by his two twisted stumps, and when he raised him high in the air with a signal-like flourish, each soul in the numberless mass thought he heard himself summoned by name. The rush that followed was peaceful enough, but it took its toll of dead expendable dross on the fringe of the surging tide. The monster children had no trouble boarding. They were passed from hand to hand over the heads of the crowd. But time and again the narrow, teeming gangplank spilled over like brimming gutters into the pitch-black water beneath ship and pier, between ship and pier, and many a soul sank down beneath the wooden pilings to join those others who had gone before, the first to win the newfound paradise. Balin was one. As the milling crowd picked up the monsters thronging about him, Mao still sticky from gorging on his sweets, he had tried to follow, but he kept falling farther and farther behind. And as he did, a link seemed to snap, that bond of flesh that had bound them to him. Now suddenly, Balin was just another white, spurned on all sides by those who knew him and those who didn't. He struggled to force his way into the torrent of bodies streaming up one of the gangplanks. But the torrent became a wall, a glass-chip wall bristling with arms and fists and claws and menacing teeth. Balin grasped at saris, clung to legs, felt his grip shaken loose. A pounding fist shut one of his eyes. Blood streamed down his mangled face and into his mouth. And all at once he clearly heard his lips pronounce these words, Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. So saying, he opened his fingers let go of the soft, smooth calf he was clutching, and fell from the gangplank halfway up, carrying off in his hand the feel of an alien flesh. His end was quick. As he sank down into the murky water, he realized how much he loved and missed the West, and that last awareness, that utter rejection of all he had stood for, so pained and distressed him that he opened a willing mouth and took himself a healthy gulp of death. Chapter 11 
On that day, and the days that followed, in all the ports along the Ganges, a hundred ships were stormed in the very same way, and not without a certain collusion by captains and crews. The turd-eater had only to appear before the crowd and speak. On more than one occasion, local police had reported him standing on the bridges of two ships at once, which would tend to prove that even though they were the victim, <clears throat> that even they were the victims of mob hysteria. To tell the truth, the human tide had swept this frenzied city clean of every vestige of authority. When one crack regiment, in fact, was ordered to shut off all roads to the port, the soldiers replied by throwing their rifles into the Ganges and lost themselves deep in the crowd. The government wouldn't have risked even that token gesture if not for the pressure that all the Western consuls had brought to bear. Soon afterwards, the ministers holed themselves up, way out in their villas, and every department chief seemed to vanish from sight. All but one, that is, the head of information, whom the Belgian consul, dean of the corps, managed to reach by telephone one last time before he too disappeared. That high official, a man of taste and breeding, seemed strangely composed, as if this assault on the Western world were as normal a thing as could be. Look, my friend, why cling to the hope that my government still has some say in all this? What's happening out on those docks is the fringe of the problem, the part we can see. Like the lava that shoots up out of the crater. Or the wave that breaks on the beach. Yes, that's what it is, a wave with another one rolling behind it, and one behind that, and another, and another, and so on, out to sea, back to the storm. That's the cause of it all. The mob of poor devils attacking the ships is just the first wave. You've seen their kind before. Their misery is nothing new. It doesn't upset you. But what about the second wave, the one right behind it? Would it shock you to learn that thousands more are on the move? Half the country, in fact. Young ones, handsome ones, ones that haven't even begun to starve. The second wave, my friend. The beautiful creatures, God's perfect specimens, these people of ours, like statues, all in all their naked glory, out of our temples, onto the road, steaming toward the port. Yes, ugliness bowing to beauty at last. And behind them the third wave, fear, and the fourth wave, famine. Two months, my friend, and five million dead already. Then the wave we call flood, stripping the country, destroying the crops, laying waste the land for five long years. And another one, off in the distance, the wave of war. More famine in its wake, more millions dead. And another, still nearer the storm, the wave of shame. The shame of those days when the West was master of our land. But through it all, through wave after wave, these people of ours, rubbing bellies for all their worth, to their bodies and souls content, to bring more millions into the world to die. Yes, that's where it all begins. That's the eye of the storm, no matter how it's hidden. And you know, it's really not a storm at all, but a great triumphant surge of life. There's no third world. No, not any more. That's only a phrase you coined to keep us in our place. There's one world, only one, and it's going to be flooded with life, submerged. This country of mine is a roaring river, a river of sperm. Now all of a sudden it's shifting course, my friend, and heading west. As he held the phone, the consul's hand was so close to his nose that he gave it a quick, unthinking sniff. And he thought of those many times, press conferences, cocktails and such, when this same official would shake his hand and steep his palm and fingers in a heavy scent, so stubborn that it took three days and twenty scrubbings with a good strong soap to wash it out. The stink of the East, the consul would murmur to himself as he rubbed his hands under the tap. And he used to wonder if, just at that moment, his counterpart, too, wasn't washing his hands for the twentieth time and thinking, Good God, the stink of the West. May I ask you something, my friend? The consul interjected. What kind of cologne do you use? The official let out a surprised little gasp. Then something of a laugh, as if he had caught the meaning behind the question. And he had, in fact, subtle mind that he was. Do you really think that's a burning issue at a time like this, my friend? Frankly, the consul, consul, C-O-N-S-U-L, laughed back. At the moment, I can't think of anything more burning. In that case, I'll tell you, I never use cologne, none at all. And you, if I don't mind my asking, if you don't mind my asking, I don't either, none at all. I thought as much. I thought so, too, the consul replied. Their laughter subsided. For a moment, there was silence. 
Then the consul continued. Well, now, there's a good solid fact I can wire my government. Uncoded, of course. It should satisfy their frantic need to know what's going on here and why. Aside from that, though, there's not too much point to our chat, I'm afraid. Not that I really expected there would be. As always, you've tried to explain away that congenital habit you people have of closing your eyes. Oh, you're a bright, clever man, I'm sure. Your whole country is bursting with bright, clever men. Men who knew what was going to happen. Your nice speech laid it out all pat. The famines, wars, floods, epidemics, the mighty myths and superstitions, the population growing by leaps and bounds. No need for a computer to predict the future here, though you people do have computers, I'm sure. Oh, no, you knew. You saw those waves that you described so well. You knew they were coming. And what did you do? Not a thing. Now, now, you're just being nasty, the official interrupted. But I don't mind. I understand. You're getting a taste of fear. That's all. Yes, fear, you bright, clever man. Well, five minutes more and I'll hang up the phone and that will be that. Then you can go shift for yourself, my friend, with your precious Western future behind you. Nobody here will give a good goddamn, myself any more than our outcasts come. And I'll thumb my nose goodbye if you want to know, even though I can't see you. If my government still cared, that's one thing I'd be sure to tell them. It would be the neatest way to wrap up the whole affair. You say we didn't do a thing, and what about you? God knows we begged you for help, but that wasn't enough. You wanted to see us fall at your feet. You wanted to make us grovel. Besides, you couldn't have stopped it. The world had plenty of warning. Your part of the world, that is. The only part that mattered... All those times, wherever they had me stationed, London, Paris, those times I'd be sitting over a drink with friends and have to watch your television screens and see my own people dying. Or open your high-class papers and read the reporters who knew what was going on, but didn't let it spoil their dinner or keep them up at night. With headlines like, Affluent Nations Conscience Unmoved by Third World Plight, Western and UN Aid Falling Far Short, future of third world seen at stake. You people all know how to read. You're not deaf. You've heard the same tune for ten years now in every key, but only from your bleeding hearts and plenty of them at that. So what did you do? You treated your conscience to a dose of guilt and then prayed to someone or other that things would stay the way they were as long as they could. That's where you went wrong. You should have held fast to your western contempt. It might have steeled you against disaster." Because that's what's brewing for you now, my friend, and you can't do a thing about it. When all is said and done, it will serve you right. No one will stand up and fight it, not even your own. Which just goes to show what a decadent lot you really are. My conscience is clear, the consul replied. No guilt, I assure you, and no contempt either. I won't deny a few pangs of fear. But fear is the only emotion this country of yours has ever made me feel. That's why I'm going to rout it out by doing my duty, pure and simple. Will I see you at the docks? My good man, you must be joking. It wasn't a joking matter, but the conversation did break off, in fact, with a kind of laugh. From that moment on, until the fleet was about to set sail, every last official from around the Ganges seemed to dissolve and disappear in silence. Chapter 12 Later, when the world learned that the fleet had sailed and heard the circumstances surrounding the consul's death, not a single voice was raised to explain or defend his action. People talked about Consul Himmons and his foolish heroics, H-I-M-M-A-N-S, but without the slightest concern for the little man trampled by the mob until he was nothing but a puddle of blood on the Ganges shore. The word pathetic, which would have been far more fitting, never even so much as rose to the lips of the anti-racists out beating the drum. Yes, the fleet was pathetic, the passengers were pathetic, but the consul was foolish. One journalist, and only one, came close to the truth, and then, on a sadly humorous note, his article was entitled, quote, Last Popgun Blast from a Dying Regime, unquote. It reviewed the major times that the West had sent its armies meddling in the lives of once second-class nations and traced its progressively weakening role down to that single symbolic shot from the consul's rifle fired in the name of a superiority that was no more. In its outward appearance, at least, the consul's heroic gesture was something of a prototype after the fact, an epitome, synthesis, conclusion all in one, 
as perfect and pure as the final creation of some terribly famous artist who paints a single line on his canvas, or dabs one dot and crawls at his crowning achievement. The consul, poor man, didn't know what a pose he had struck. He had looked for no models to follow, he had felt no epic grandeur in his soul, no taste for theatrics, and yet his death was theater at its best. His army, for example, reduced to a single soldier, the faithful Sikh, S-I-K-H, was one of those comic theatrical symbols, the shabby, half-starved actor loping across the stage and awkwardly showing a sign with the words, His Excellency, the Western Consul's Troops. Worth noting, too, was the fact that the army in question respected the age-old tradition that, over the years, had cemented the power and might of the West beyond its borders. It was a native army, conditioned to abhor its own the way the white man's dog abhors the blacks. More noteworthy still, the fact that this army, venal to the core, hired out to maintain the Western hold on a worldwide domain, was reduced to a single man. And so, with one soldier behind him, the consul stepped forward, a wizened figure in his English shorts, his half-sleeved shirt, flapping over a gaunt gray chest, to confront a million flailing savages. Not that there really was, to be sure, in that crowd as we know it, a single wildly flailing savage, but simply because in all the glorious tales of Western conquerors, from Cortez and Pizarro to our own Bornazel and his African exploits, the white man is pictured alone, or almost, advancing against the unbridled menacing hordes, and putting them all to flight by his imposing presence. The charm, however, had long since been broken. The poor little consul looked rather like a tired old magician, who knows that he's going to bungle his trick, and does, but who tries it on the audience all the same, not for his honor or anything of the sort, but because even a worn-out magician deserves an orderly end, however absurd, just as a worn-out hero of the Western world deserves to perform one last bizarre, eccentric feat for the public that used to applaud him. Once admiration gives way to disdain, the bizarre, after all, is the only way out that makes much sense. And why not? Weren't jesters always cleverer than their kings? So be it. In this new swarthy reign, the white man will be the jester. It's as simple as that. Though in this new swarthy reign, the white man will be the jester. It's as simple as that. High noon, and there by the docks the little western consul appeared at the head of his army. To say that the army's morale was low would be rather an understatement. It was catastrophic. The army was in utter disarray. disarray. Its antique rifle trembled in time with its panic. But be careful to re but careful to re excuse me. But careful to refrain from introspection and strutting puppet-like close behind its cadaverous, knobby-kneed commander, it still caused enough of a stir, with its Belgian drill step, English style, head high and vacant stare, whatever you do, never look at a thing, that it made the crowd give way and let them through. So the magic really is still there, if only the numbers were. If we'd kept their ner our nerve, he's saying. The mob was sizzling in the noonday sun, and the consul sniffed. Then he took a big white kerchief from his pocket and tied it around his nose and mouth. Like Marshal Bugode and his desert legionnaires. No doubt this act of instinctive revulsion, quite unintended, struck those up front as openly hostile. It was in that spirit that they described it to the ones behind them, who passed it down the line and into the heart of the crowd. In no time a murderous cry had gone up. The army tightened ranks. That is to say, the Sikh guard tightened his rump, and felt a cold sweat trickling down his thighs, as his gun barrel trembled madly against a sky turned black with shaking fists. The consul struggled to push his way through the mass of flesh, growing denser and denser, and managed to reach the pier. A big ship sat at her moorings, almost as high as the India Star. Three gangplanks connected her to land. Three teeming human anthills on the move. At the foot of one, with his back to the crowd and his face toward the sea, stood a mournful-looking white man, arms upraised. "'What are you doing here?' the consul asked the bishop. "'Do you think it's time for us relics to die?' "'On different sides, of course.' 
The bishop smiled and completed his blessing. You remind me of Christ, the consul went on, but a dead Christ at that. I've lost my job, but I'm willing to admit it. That's where we're different, you and I. You want to keep fooling yourself in the name of some meaningless God. A God that's in your head and nowhere else. Well, take a good look at the rabble around us, then draw your own conclusions. You're nothing to them. Just a broken-down padre spreading a useless gospel. Whereas I, well, at least for a moment they'll know I exist, and sooner than they think. No, Your Grace, I'm afraid you're all alone. They don't have the vaguest idea what you're up to. But you go ahead and bless them all the same, little fellow. That's what I was saw you doing, wasn't it? You were actually giving the mob your blessing. Quite so, said the bishop. As prefect apostolic to the entire Ganges region, I'm wishing my flock a bon voyage and praying for God's help to speed them on their way. What meaningless mumbo-jumbo, the consul replied. Bishop or not, you're still a simple priest at heart. Time was when bishops were born, not made, and priests were just priests. Now nobody draws lines anymore, and it's all mixed up. Really, who do you think will fall for such talk? A bishop for this ganji scum? That's just what they needed. And you think God will bother to help the likes of them? Maybe yours, but not mine. I'm damn sure of that. The Sikh had turned a deathly green, twitching and squirming about, convulsed with fear. He looked toward the two men having their calm salon chat in the midst of the crowd, then pivoted around in a flash, like a tank's revolving turret in a slapstick film, his gun barrel grazing the wall, faces huddling thick about them. Then, completing his turn, he faced the consul again like a dervish, whirling in a circle of fear, hoping that the next time around his master would finally listen. Consul, Sai, please let's go. They're not afraid of me any more. They're almost on top of us. A few seconds and they won't be afraid of you either. Then we'll never get out of here alive. Please, Consul Sahib, I've served your country all these years. Now save me. Please, for heaven's sake, save me. Is your rifle loaded? No, Consul Sahib. What good would it do? Well, then load it, you idiot. Shame on the Sikh guards. Glory and pride of empires past. After four fruitless tries, the order was carried out, finally, by a warrior fallen from grace, beard and turban a tremble, who looked like a drunkard struggling to find the keyhole with his key. It was then that the bishop replied to the consul's remarks. God won't help them, you say. Well, listen, he's doing just that. Impossible, but true. See, they're on their way. The whistle on the India star gave out such a mournful wail that it would have brought a shudder to even the most mildly superstitious of captains. It was like the orgasmic groaning of some deaf-mute colossus, some giant in heat, unaware of the frenzy of sounds he was forcing from his throat. First a few short blasts, some high, some low, then all of them blending into one immense gasp, each note of the scale scraping against the next without snuffing it out. The great organ pipe of the Indian star rust through here and there in holes of various sizes, booming out the chant of its last divine office, after which it proceeded to burst just as the monster totem up in the bridge was closing his toothless mouth. The Calcutta star sat at dockside, decayed, one shining symbol of a decaying city. Her captain had draped himself in a kind of pilgrim cloak, but still had on his braided cap. He looked for all the world like a glove puppet, standing there on board, arms waving at the sailors, hauling up the gangplanks. Two of them were up already. The western consul and his army had taken their positions at the foot of the third. At the top, a small patch of empty deck appeared to the waiting hordes in the pier, quite able to hold them all, and so they began to edge forward, slowly at first, in a single solid mass, like some gigantic beast with a million legs and a hundred heads the closest of which was a handsome young man's, the picture of sublime inspiration, whose face seemed consumed by a pair of shining eyes, and who found himself suddenly barrel to brow with the western artillery, such as it was. Fire! the consul ordered. He had never used that word before in a similar context, and it startled him a little to hear himself utter it now for the very first time. It was then, on the threshold of death, that the poor little man discovered the joy of personal contact with soldierly lore. Fire! One more colony falls at your feet, sir. Fire! Tahiti surrenders. Run up the colors. Fire! The Sultan of 
Padakahuet implores the Republic's protection. Fire, fire, fire! The Arab rebel bastards bite the dust of the desert stockades. We're a great and generous people, after all, but still, so ready, aim, fire! The consul emerged from his daydream, jarred awake as the army drew back without a shot. What are you waiting for? Fire, you idiot! At which point the army deserted. It did so in the disarray of utter defeat, in its usual cowardly manner. Would God ever show us a conquering army turn tail and desert? No doubt, especially if the shabby lot that pretend to speak in his name ever get their way. The Sikh threw his rifle into the, thrust his rifle into the consul's hands and dove into the Ganges. You're not really going to shoot, said the bishop. Oh, yes, I am. And I'm going to shoot to kill, said the consul, leveling his gun at the doe-eyed multi-beast before him. But what on earth for? The consul was staring right into the eyes of the handsome, dark young man at the end of his rifle. The crowd paused a moment before the final push. What do you want me to say? The consul answered. For glory? Honor? Some principle or other? For Christian civilization or nonsense like that? Well, not at all. I'm going to turn off those bright, shining eyes just for the pleasure it gives me. I have no brothers in this mob of Martians. They're nothing to me. And now, finally, I'm going to prove it. He fired. One of the beast's hundred heads disappeared, a bloody hole between its eyes. But it grew right back in the shape of a square black face with massive jaws and a hate-filled look. The consul was thrown to the ground in a frenzy of blows. The bishop bent over a scrawny, prostrate form. Prostrate form. In the name of the Lord, I forgive you, he said. In the name of the Lord, eat shit, the consul gasped. Then the hundred heads plunged forward as the surging beast, compressed within the confines of the gangplank, climbed on its thousands of legs to the deck of the Calcutta Star. Swept along in the tide, absorbed and digested, the bishop found himself lifted aboard and dropped down in place by the great human wave, alive but inert like a shipwrecked sailor who, by some miracle, washes ashore in the sands of an unknown island. In that crushing welter of flesh, however, that horde, exuding its mystic fervor through each of its pores, he had lost almost all sense of who and what he was. And when in turn the Calcutta Star sailed out of the port, the bishop thought he saw, there in the deserted dock by the Ganges, a score of stray dogs lapping up a shining pool of blood with a hundred others racing through the empty streets to join in the feast. Really, is that all that's left of the consul, he wondered, the only coherent idea that managed to muddle its way through his head. He even thought he saw one of the dogs spelling words in the blood on his tongue, with his tongue. But the ship was already out too far, and he couldn't read what they said, or even be sure that they really were words, though it seemed for a moment he could make out a few Latin syllables. For days on end he would sit transfixed on deck, in the stench of a yogi-style squat, racking his brain to the rhythmic swish of the water along the hull, trying to recall what his eyes had dimly seen. So doing, he took leave of his senses. And that's where we'll leave it today. Conclusion of page 51 and chapter 12, and we see the... Uh, how it began back in India. So we've seen it's on the verge of France, and we see how it started back in India in this session, too. I want to thank you for being with me today, and I'll be back with you again next time real, real soon.